Welcome back to another GTN Coaches Corner where we answer your triathlon training related questions. This week we will be discussing how to miss training when it's been planned for a vacation or work trip. Yeah, someone has an issue when they've changed from a road bike to a triathlon bike with their saddle. Mm. And what are the advantages and disadvantages to training on a road bike for a TT bike race? Yep. And then someone also has a question about your recovery intervals when you're doing interval training. And can you split one session into two, morning and evening? All right, right, let's get to it. Remember, you can leave your own questions below this video or any other one. Use the hashtag DTN Coaches Corner. We could be answering it next time. Jamie Furman, uh, friend of the channel. Thanks for writing in, Jamie. Hashtag GTN Coaches one Corner. One day we'll meet him. One day we'll meet him, yeah. <laughs> As a follow-up to the seemingly popular question about missing slash making up training sessions, I have my A race full distance planned in mid-August. I'll be on vacation for a week in early July when I have two key long bike and run sessions scheduled. Well, the schedule goes far in advance, doesn't it? Uh, and will not be at the pool or road bike access. I will have access to a spin bike. Would it be beneficial trying to do my key bike workouts on the spin bike while away? Or should I focus on a run and cross training heavy week instead? Ooh. Should I try to do the key bike workouts before slash after I return? Okay, mm. first one rule of thumb here do never or never try to make up for any missed sessions before or post because yeah. well you you may spend the entire holiday worrying about a niggle that you picked up from trying to cram loads of <laughs> sessions in beforehand <laughs> yeah exactly uh you definitely don't want to cram uh, also there's not so much you can do about the swim while you're away uh you can use stretch cords which will help keep you relaxed and help keep those muscles activated your shoulders nice and flexible but that's about it if you don't have access to a pool however you can rearrange your program a little bit to build in the fact that you're going to be away from your bike for that week uh, and have limited access to your bike and more access to running potentially. Now, the error some people make is that they go, well, run heavy week, I'm gonna smash the run and then they overdo it. You still have to stick to around about the 10% rule. So don't suddenly ramp it up too much. You can, you can do a run heavy week while you're away and then to compensate for the fact that you were kind of off your bike a bit, you can do a bike heavy week when you come back. But both of those should be limited to around 10% increase on what your normal run week or your normal bike week should be. You, As Mark says, you can't cram your training in just because you're not swimming and, and biking and do a whole bunch of extra running because that is a recipe for a niggle. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, something is better than nothing. So if you can get on a spin bike and maybe the rest of being there on vacation, you might have a fantastic work workout but with you the specificity of it and maybe not being able to read power on the spin bike and various things like that may not be great but as i say something is better than nothing if you can adapt the training and the workouts so that perhaps you're doing them in future weeks but actually adapting those workouts rather than trying to catch up as we were just saying uh that would probably be my preference you may also find that while you're away because you're not doing the swimming and biking so much the run sessions that you do do are far more effective. Yeah. And you actually, by having a run-focused week, not losing as much of your overall race performance as you think you might, it might actually be a, more of a good thing than a bad thing, actually, yeah, yeah. to just have that week where you focus on your run, your run goes really, really well, and you get that little run boost. Yeah. So don't stress too much about it. Yeah, nice one. Um, next one from Lewis. Lewis Gill, Lewis Gill. Um, hey, thanks for such great content. I really appreciate as a new guy on this triathlon journey, I have a question regarding my seat. I'm coming from a road race background and now with a TT bike, I went to my trusted biomechanics for fit and everything goes great except the seat. I have a pro stealth seat with a middle hole, but now I'm experiencing a new level of hurt on my insight area. Not sure what an insight area is. I'm sure, I, I think we can probably guess. Uh, do you recommend a special TTC or another strategy? Yeah, I'm not sure what an insight area is, but if that's where his insights come from, <laughs> we're all gonna be worried. Yeah, uh, okay, your position is very different on a TT bike than a road bike. Even an aggressive road bike, where you shift your whole weight forward a little bit and get lower in the front, you are still sitting on your sit bones, essentially, and a road bike saddle is designed to support your weight on those sit bones. Whereas in a TT bike, when you rotate those hips a little bit further forward, your sit bones are essentially up in the air and most of your weight is now on your perineum, your inside area, as I think the user is calling it. Uh, it's, uh, it's hard to, to do that on a road saddle. They are hard and unforgiving and even a cutout is not really doing anything at that point because you're sitting so far forward on it. You do need a specific time trial slash triathlon saddle for this, for your, for your triathlon bike. 
Yeah, I would not be able to hold a TT position on that pro stuff, sadly. I had a little Google just to <laughs> yeah. check and yeah. it won't work for me. Yeah, a, t- a time trial triathlon saddle has a longer nose and they have more cushioning in that nose. It is forgiving, it allows uh, blood flow, etc., in that area without really hurting. Like, it is. It makes a big difference. Huge. So invest in the various options. There are multiple options. Some of them actually have cut-off noses where you still sit on your sit bones and there's almost like nothing underneath the front end of the saddle. You kind of almost float uh, on the front. Uh, those are, I, I've never got on well with those. I, I've always sat on a, a saddle with a nose. Uh, or you do get the noses that are well cushioned. Either way, either of those is gonna be significantly better than trying to force a road bike saddle to work for you. Uh, we would say suggest though that don't delay. Get this sorted out. It is. It is a serious thing. Obviously, you're never going to be that comfortable when you're racing as hard as you can, but you shouldn't have so much pain in your insight area. And also, you could actually do lasting damage. So get it sorted sooner rather than later. Okay, next question from Hunter Flagman. He's been burning to ask this question, so much so he sent it in a couple of times. Is there any benefit to doing any of your bike sessions in a road bike position to take advantage of the added power or should every session be in the aero position? They've gone on then to ask again because essentially they've seen a lot of the pros training on their road bike. So are they benefiting from using the road bike or is it a disadvantage for someone like an amateur? Yeah, well, for specificity, you have to be in a time trial position, you have to get used to it, you have to be powerful in it, and therefore you have to do a fair amount of your training in that time trial position. However, you do see a lot of pros spend a lot of time on their road bikes. They also have a lot of time. Exactly, they also spend a lot of time on their time trial bikes. The advantage of doing so many hours on the bike, they could probably do six or seven hours a week on their time trial bike, and still do 10 hours a week on their road bike. So if you have that luxury, brilliant. But most people don't. Uh, You need to prioritize spending enough time on your time trial bike to get fast and strong and comfortable on that time trial bike. Uh, And don't go out on your road bike and err on that side and and kind of forget about getting ready for this. You can't do all your training on a road bike and then hop into a race on a time trial bike and think you're gonna perform. That said, road bike or TT bike, you are still pedaling in circles. There is yeah. still some benefit to riding a, a road bike. There is a lot of transfer, and I suspect if you've got yourself incredibly fit on a road bike, a lot of that is gonna, you, you're gonna transfer a lot of that over onto the TT bike. From experience, um, when you do jump onto a TT bike, and we will have spent a lot of our kind of off season on a road bike, then we get onto the TT bike, and you feel it in areas you kind of forgotten about. Inside so area. <laughs> yeah, inside. Uh, and yeah, if you're not training those regularly, then um, yeah, you are going to feel that when it comes to race day. So make sure, as James said, you prep specific as possible. Use that TT bike as much. Another as possible. thing a lot of people find is that TT bikes can be a little antisocial. Mm. You can't go out and group rides with them. You're you're less fun to ride with, and therefore they ride less or they don't ride yep. as often. Uh, so if Riding your TT bike is going to limit the amount of riding. You're going to do more hours if you go on your road bike and join a bunch of mates. Then definitely do that. Just compensate for that by doing your shorter intervals or some indoor training on your TT bike in your TT position the rest of the week so that you are ready for it on race day. Okay, next question. Uh, Liab Trasi? Uh, I don't know how you pronounce that. Uh, I have a question regarding interval training. How fast slash slow are you supposed to do your run when you do the recovery jog? I heard different opinions about it. One saying you need to get your heart rate back down and one saying it's easier to just keep the interval pace up if you still run but at a slower pace. I always end up walking as I feel I can't get the pace back if I just run slower or did I choose a pace that I'm not quite ready for yet. I aim to run a 50 minute 10K and I do intervals at five minutes per kilometer or faster. My previous 10K time is 56 uh, or 54 from four months ago. So they don't actually say how hard they're running in these intervals or, or no. sorry, or, or the length of the intervals or what the goal is. Um, and I guess that's the important factor here because if you're doing VO2 intervals, so really high intensity intervals where you're probably trying to, you're trying to hit above that race pace, then that's gonna require a, significant, a serious amount of effort and therefore you're going to make, need to make sure that you recover well because you'll have produced a lot of lactic acid um, and therefore to hit those paces, rep after rep, you're gonna need a good recovery between. Yeah. But if you're doing more of a threshold interval, it's a very different type of session. Yeah, because then your goal is to kind of actually just take the intervals, the little breaks, to push up the total amount of time you can run at that threshold. And you don't actually want to 
recover fully in between them. You wanna get straight back into the next interval. After you've had a little breather and got your heart rate down a little bit, back to that threshold pace so that you push out the amount of time you spent at threshold pace for that whole session. So in that case, you want a shorter interval where your heart rate drops a little bit, but before you completely recover, you start in again as opposed to VO2 max ones where you want almost a complete recovery so you can go max out again. So yeah, we're not really sure what their goal is. It does depend on your goal. We would say it sounds like the second one yeah. that they're trying to do threshold intervals. And if they get into the point that they can't recover in that time without walking, they're probably doing their threshold intervals a little bit too hard. They're pushing just a little bit too high intensity, building up a little bit too much lactic acid, and then you have to walk to recover uh, and you're not actually getting the benefit of that kind of complete time in your threshold or at your threshold or near your threshold. We would suggest bring the pace down just slightly of those intervals uh, so that you can get to a point where you feel like you can start the next interval in 60 to 90 seconds of easy jogging. If you're not getting to that point, your intervals are too hard or too long uh, and you need to bring them down again. For threshold intervals, if you can't get back to ready for the next interval in 60 to 90 seconds, you're definitely pushing too hard. We've all been there though, haven't we, James? I never pushed too hard. Oh, all right, okay. <laughs> right, final question from Anstack18. Um, how does split training in a day work? I have a duathlon coming up in May and some days on the bike call for over an hour of training. With three young boys and a full-time job, it gets hard when it comes to a training session of more than 45 minutes. However, for a session of, say, an hour and a half, I could fit 45 minutes in the morning before work and 45 minutes after we put the boys to bed. Does this work? This is an interesting question. Yeah, well, you see, the thing is, if he's got a program that's calling for over an hour, it's obviously not in any way catered to him. Mm. And you don't really want to just take that session that was built into the program and just stop it halfway through and yeah. do the other half of that session <laughs> that evening. You want two specific sessions that fit into the time you have available. So you want a specific 45-minute session in the morning and another specific 45. Having said that, though, split training does work. Yeah you can actually get the benefits of training from split sessions. There are a few things that you're going to sacrifice, splitting up your training into small small bite-sized segments, uh, like the endurance aspect and the mental uh, uh, training aspect of actually doing a longer session and keeping pushing for that month time. But other than that, you can get most of the physiological benefits from splitting your training morning and evening. I think, I think it just takes a little bit of uh, pre-thought and creativity because, as James says, if you let's take a sweet spot session, for instance, and you've got two lots of 15 minutes at sweet spot, if you just stop after the first 15 minutes or partway through it, um, <laughs> and then you pick up the second rep later on in the day, the whole idea of that second rep was that fatigue going from that first rep into the second. So you've kind of missed the point of the session. And that's just one example. There'll be many other sessions like that. So if you're just drawing a line down the middle and splitting them in half, you're not quite getting the benefit that they were intended yeah. to. Having said that, though, it's just an easy aerobic ride. If you do the Go easy aerobic in 45 minutes in the morning, 45 minutes in the evening, the difference between just an hour and a half of aerobic riding and 245 minutes Absolutely. is probably immeasurable. In fact, Cy Richardson did a video on that very recently on GCN. So yeah, go check that out because it's very interesting. Yeah. So, that's it for this week's questions. As we said at the beginning, if you have your own questions below this video, hashtag GTN Coaches Corner so we can actually find it and we could be answering it next week. See you next time.